Okay. Um, so yeah, today I will be talking a lot about shiny applications. Um, I personally, I'm a big fan. Uh, I guess that uh, you also find them useful uh, throughout your career from your projects. And I worked for several uh, pharmaceutical companies and introduced um, build shiny applications uh, for them. And I saw how especially it is uh, really nice to play around uh, with your um, scripts, analysis, um, studies there in a way of interactive shiny applications. Uh, but one way is to to play with with the shiny application and actually like see your your analysis interactive. And another much more complicated stuff is making them production ready, productionalized uh, shiny applications. Uh, for that, you need to introduce a lot of different components and take care of a lot of different uh, areas of how you're building shiny applications. Today, I would like to present you uh, setting a reproducible air shiny project environment. And we will be focusing on how to make this uh, production ready application, how to start this, what things uh, is required to make sure that this will work everywhere, every time, and that you can uh, actually trust those, those results. My name is Martin Dubel, and I work in Absinon company and building the reproducible production ready shiny applications is what we do every day. So coming back to our map of the areas of the shiny applications, we will take out a few of those that we won't uh, take care of today. They are also super important, but we will focus on making sure that um, our application is reproducible production application. We will start simple with the cold sharing. I bet everyone is already there and you are not sharing your code in a form of some uh, zip folders uh, or uh, versioning by, by naming. Uh, and you're all familiar with different tools for the repositories based on, on, on the Git, uh, like GitHub, Bitbucket, or GitLab. And so this is kind of like a 101 uh, class for making sure that your application is reproducible, that you have your, your code on some uh, repository. Uh, however, uh, you can ask yourself a question whether you are uh, making use of those. And I saw this a lot that, uh, that uh, OK, we have Git, uh, but we are like putting everything into the main branch without checking what is there, without actually splitting our work to branches, without any meaningful commits, and without doing reviews. So uh, the base of making sure that uh, your application will be uh, reproducible and production is to make sure that your process of building this is actually uh, reliable. But okay, this is the very basic. Uh, let's go to what we should keep outside of the repository. And definitely um, storing the, all the data files that I bet for the pharmaceutical companies for your project in bioinformatics, it's also quite uh, typical for maybe for that reason only that the data is so huge that it's impossible to store this uh, in the repository. So usually there are some databases or some file sharing things. Uh, but also what is not so obvious all the time, we cannot store the credentials there uh, in the repository. So for a local development, we usually use the rnviron file. So this is the file when you set your environmental variables, for example, the credentials to the database. Uh, or you can use the really nice feature of RStudio Connect if you are using that and probably if you're working in some uh, some huge organizations, they are have the license for RStudio Connect or Posit Connect. Uh, and um, this is a really nice way to store your uh, credentials. So that's uh, the uh, obvious thing for the security reasons why we don't want to keep this in the repository. We want that to be secure. Okay, speaking about the reproducibility, we need to talk about the different environments. And um, here I will mean that uh, we would like to make sure that whatever I'm building on my machine, it will work on my machine as well in the future. It will work on the other machines. It will work on the server when I deploy this. Okay, so the first, again, the baby step 
uh, is that we don't want to have any uh, local paths to some uh, to some uh, not not relative paths to something on my computer so that when I move around my project it still works so always start with with using our projects and use the relative paths to, to the project itself okay so that will kind of assure that when I move around my project, it will still work. However, I want to make sure that uh, it's not only working when I move it like around my computer, it also works in time when there are different versions of, of packages and also when I move this to uh, my colleague, my teammate computer. For that, I'm also pretty sure that you've already heard this because this is um, a game changer for Shiny application for a few years right now. Uh, so you should be familiar with RNF package and that allows you to separate your project uh, environment and here I mean the version of the packages that you are using uh, from the rest of your R projects and allows you to share this state and send this to a repository so that your teammates can take uh, clone this and restore the environment with the same um version of packages setup is super simple and restoring environment is super simple and that will allow you to move in time on your machine so that you can come back in months or years to the same project restore the versions of the packages that were used and rerun and expect the same results but also your teammate can take your project restore the environment and expect the same results um, However, this is only dealing with the version of our packages and there are there can be different dependencies that we are using. So there can be some system dependencies, there can be an R version itself, uh, which RENF is not, not solving that problem. Uh, there is a warning that uh, different R version was used, but it's not solving that problem. Uh, for this, the Docker images, the containers are a really nice solution so that you can actually share the exact same um, environment with all the system dependencies our version and the packages there usually you are using them combined so you build your docker image and one step in building them and the container is to restore the environment based on what is in the renv log file this is uh, the, the file the instruction of what versions of packages to restore is called uh, log file um, Usually nowadays, again, with the uh, with the connect uh, and all those projects from uh, our studio posit, um, there is much simpler because there is a uh, there is a server already predefined with the workbench and and the and the connect server that are the same for all users, and you don't need to um, care about the containers. Um, you, you do need to care about keeping your uh, RENF log uh, for your project, but all the system dependencies should be should be solved. Okay, so this is the environment. And when we are talking about environment, you've probably heard a lot about like uh, that we need to have a production environment, development environment, and we would like them to be the same so that whenever we are building on a, a development environment and we deploy this to production, it works the same. And yes, this is crucial. And this should be solved with all those tools that I presented on the on the previous slide. Uh, but I would also like to to talk a little bit about the configuration. Um, what I see as a mature reproducible production application is actually how it behaves on a non-production environment, how it is configured. Um, usually, I see. Um, useful to have five different uh, setups for the application and to store in the config file how this should we behave because of course we want them to be the same in the, when we are talking about the environment so what are the version of packages dependent system dependencies our version that stuff but we usually want them to behave differently for example to use the different uh, different data so there is a production database with a, like real data that maybe we are not only reading, but we're also writing to this database. And definitely it shouldn't be the same data that we are using for tests or the development. And, 
and that can be specified in config. There are sometimes the, some features that um, that should be um, should be differentiated between those environments. Uh, usually, for the um, uh, projects in Shiny for pharmaceutical companies, uh, we were adding in non-production environment some like big warning that this is only the test. Like, don't rely on this data that you have here because we we really don't want uh, to make the decisions uh, based on the fake data that we're using for development. And if someone is accidentally there on the wrong link, we want a big banner to be there um, displayed for that environment. Okay, so those five environments that we see uh, useful, of course, production. So here, users, stakeholders, developers, all of those parties involved, they think that this is a working application and uh, we all believe that um, this is this is stable this is um, what we can reproduce and rely on uh, there is usually also a test uh, deployment when stakeholders and developers think that it's work but users are about to test this so usually for a very mature production applications uh, the, we have the release candidates on test once the release candidates pass all the tests um, automated tests, user tests, uh, we can merge this to the production. Uh, there is also development environment when developers think that it works and uh, this is what was specified in the, in the tasks. Uh, but now someone who is um, managing the application, some business units, some subject matter experts, they are testing before this will be shared with the, with the users. And there is also a sandbox environment that we found super useful, uh, whether you can deploy just to check particular features, just to check how this behaves on a on a deployed uh, server. It should be the same as, as on the development, but um, it's always good to test. And usually what I suggest to include is also the config for the offline mode. So when the, there is no database connection, um, so that you can actually work without being blocked uh, because database is down. But this is also useful for uh, other purposes. Um, let me share a little bit why those configs are super useful. Um, as I said, usually what, what you want is to for the application to get to the different data. So it allows you to separate your application from your data layer and test them uh, independently and it's usually speeds up the development uh, my experience from the uh, projects in a pharmaceutical companies bioinformatics uh, projects is that we are not uh, well, the performance is not the uh, main uh, goal because we want the results to be to be good to be fine to be reliable and we can wait for them um sometime it doesn't need to be blazingly fast but for the development you can use a smaller data set uh, just some fake results to make this much faster to build those applications and you can modify how this should behave based on the config um, you can of course test your uh, new features carefully on a dev or sandbox environments and your automated tests can and faster the same, you can just plug into the fake data and make sure that everything works and the data will be tested. Uh, the data itself will be tested separately. Here we can focus on the uh, on the, on the the application themselves. Uh, yes, we can have the reproducible app state on the mock data. Uh, if we are talking about the very dynamic data sets that may be changing uh, a lot, it will be difficult to set up the, um, the unit tests based on this or the front end tests that will display the comparable, comparable results uh, every time. And also, we, if something is wrong, we won't know whether this is like the new data is something wrong with the new data or the application stops working. So if we can use on some config like, like dev or test or, or the sandbox, um, or offline, the mock data that will be used, the same mock data, we will be able to test just the features of the application and we'll be able to reproduce it every time the same. Um, and usually that, that was the case uh, for 
for such projects that the data stored there is kind of um, not something to expose. So having the uh, offline call config, for example, ready to just share your application, present it somewhere on a, on a conference uh, for some new stakeholders to, to new developers, or maybe the developers themselves shouldn't be allowed to see that data, the actual production data, and they can only work on the mock data. That is really helpful there. Um, and what we mean, uh, what I mean by having the different uh, configs, usually it's as easy as having just a YAML file that will specify, okay, for, for that config, you can use uh, those views from that database using those credentials. And for others, um, you are switching between different uh, names of the views, uh, credentials, uh, whatever you will specify. Um, you can also inherit um, between those different configs that will allow you to uh, make this super efficient. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you and see you. So that's great to start. How are you doing today? Um, okay, sorry. Okay, I started to see the green room. Um, okay, um, two more things. Um, the um, CI and test uh, my recommendation, start each and every project with the CI and test structure. Uh, I won't go into details of how you can actually like, build your test. Uh, you can do it later, but use something, some automated CI tools like GitHub Actions, use the templates to just repeat those every time the same and make sure that this is green and later you can add your tests incrementally. Uh, also, two more things because we discussed about testing applications separated to testing your data and testing your log logic. Here, I can recommend you the targets um, package that was previously called Drake for building and uh, how your logic looks like. And also the data validator package that here you can automate testing your data. So for example, if there is this dynamic database, you are getting your data. Uh, you can, before uploading this to production server, you can run the tests on the data side and um, and test those separately and only if the tests are passed this will be sent to your production application to be used if something is wrong uh, you can delay this process send some email notification to check the data maybe there is something wrong there and you can also uh, apply this to different uh, config files okay so we have our shiny application and we have all those parts covered. Some of them were uh, that we discussed today. Some of those you can learn on um, different materials, talks from Epsilon, um, maybe on some other conference. Um, and with this, you should be able to start with the production reproducible application. Uh, I think the uh, last takeout note will be that you should have this in mind when you start you should have tools ready to make it from the very beginning uh, because later it will be difficult to introduce all of those concepts. Um, thank you for this and you can uh, reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, thank you for today. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. Can I you can hear me? Hear you. Perfect. That's yes. It. Perfect. Thank you. I was having so much technical issues, so I appreciate it, everyone. Thank you so much for your talk. I didn't see any questions in the chat, but I was having technical issues, so I'm not sure if there were any. I didn't see any in the Q&A either. Um, Beth, I'm not sure if you noticed any questions for our speaker. We have about one minute before the next talk is up. Nope, I didn't see anything. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and you. then we're going to bring up our next talk, which is a recorded talk uh, that is presented by Jacqueline Jonas of um, our studio. And I don't believe that she was going to be available for questions, but thank you.